Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Ezekiel class. We are currently in class number 11, and this morning we're going to cover chapter 15, and we're going to do about a third of chapter 16 through verse 21. Now, chapter 16 is actually the longest chapter in, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, and uh, it's an interesting chapter as we get into it. We'll talk about it, but first we're going to get to chapter 15. So where we are, we are still, Ezekiel is a book of 48 chapters that covers 13 visions that Ezekiel has from God, and we are still in the second of those visions, and this vision is all about excuses that people use for sin, and specifically it's about excuses that Israel used for sin back in its day, but if you change the wording around a little bit, it's very rele relevant to us today in our situation today, in our world today, and even us as individuals today as, uh, as we make excuses for sin. So we're in the various excuses for sin that God has given us so far. And uh, up, until, up until now, we've covered five of them. We're going to cover a sixth one today. I'll get to that one later. But here's the five that we've covered today. The first excuse is... The Lord will never really execute judgment on sin. It's all a myth. It's not really going to happen. God's going to take everybody to heaven someday. Don't worry. It's just not a problem. We see that a lot of places in the world. We see some religious leaders in the world that are teaching that. That is not at all what it says here in the Bible. What it says here in the Bible is that God will execute judgment for sin. And, uh, and it's coming. And it's coming on, on everyone. Uh, on, on everyone who has chosen sin. The second one up here is that the Lord will delay judgment indefinitely. The Lord is, is just delayed judgment for sin for so long, so what makes us think it's ever really going to happen? It, and if it ever does happen, it'll be so late that it'll never really affect us. That's We see that thinking around as well. We also see the thinking that says, you know what? I'm going to be on this earth for 70 years. I'll wait until I'm 69, and then I'll get right with the Lord. And meanwhile, I'll just enjoy my nice, sinful life doing what I want to do. And, uh, and someday I'll get right with the Lord when I'm on my deathbed. And it'll, uh, that way I'll have the best of both worlds, right? The best of this world and the best of the next world. Well, the price of sin is eternal death. And, and we'd never know when the Lord might take us. I could walk out of here and get hit by a semi five minutes later. We could have a heart attack, whatever. There's anything that could happen today, and uh, we, don't know when it, we don't know when the Lord is going to bring us home. But when he brings us home, that's it. We will, at that point, we either have grace or we have judgment. Those are the two options, and we, have make, it, we have make that choice during our lives. We either choose to have grace or we choose to have judgment. If we stay in sin, we choose judgment. If we get out of sin and get with the Lord, we choose grace. So we need to make that decision. Making that decision now is the right answer. And uh, um, God is very patient. He has been patient with Israel for hundreds of years at this point that we're studying in Ezekiel. And he's patient with us. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't want anybody to not be with him permanently, forever. But at some point, there will come a point where he draws the line with each one of us. So, The third one up here is there will be peace. It's the idea that, don't worry, we'll muddle through this. We've always muddled through in the past. You know, we've been, things of, things of, yeah, Israel's been in sin for a long time, but God has protected us. Don't worry, we're going to somehow muddle through this. We're going to get through this. You see that today in America a lot because, you know, it's been 240 years and we've, uh, in 240 years in America, we've had a lot going on and somehow we always figure out how to come through it and do okay, right? That's kind of the thinking. Therefore, we'll always be okay. We can just go on being more sinful and more sinful and more sinful, but eventually it's always going to be okay. That's the thinking that you hear everywhere. You see it in the press, you see it anywhere around you. Well. It's not what God is telling us. God is telling us there will be peace for a while, but eventually, if you don't have peace with God, if you don't have peace with Christ, there will be no peace eventually. The only true peace in the world we get by being is by being connected to God. The uh, fourth excuse we've looked at that people have, have had is that our leaders are the ones that lead us into sin, right? 
So God's going to judge them, not us. I mean, after all, we're just following the orders, right? We just I talked last week about Sergeant Schultz and Hogan's Heroes. I was just following the orders, right? Interestingly enough, they had, I was on the internet yesterday. They had an article on Sergeant Schultz, picture of him on the internet. So thank you, Lord, for putting that there. But um, um, it's the idea that we have leaders who tell us what to do, and we do what we're supposed to do. And if they are sinful and they lead us into sin, it's not our fault, right? It's their fault. They, they're the ones. God's not going to hold us responsible, is he? Well, he most certainly is. God is going to hold each one of us individually responsible for what we do. God is also going to hold those leaders responsible for what they have done. That's a different issue. God will deal with that one too. Don't worry, he's going to deal with that. But he's going to deal with us if we choose to go in an evil direction. If we choose to go in a sinful direction in life, God will deal with us for, for making that choice. But if, and, and he will also deal with our leaders who have led us in that direction. And our leaders may be in the press, they may be in academia, they may be the people that are educating our children in schools, they may be politicians, they may be dictators, whatever. Um, we can't just palm it off on our leaders. That's not how God's going to work this deal. The next one here, and the one we finished up on last week, is if we stay close to righteous people, we'll be okay. Just we don't have to be we don't have to get out of sin ourselves. We just need to stay in a community where everybody else is kind of in, is kind of good and kind of righteous. That doesn't work either. Again, God is going to judge us based upon our connection either to him or to sin. That's the choice we make here on earth. We have however many years God gives us to make a choice. Either we connect with sin, we stay in sin, or we connect with God, one or the other. And at the end of our lives, that's the decision that we have made. And we can, if we choose to remain in sin, we can hang out with all the Mother Teresas of the world. It's really not going to do us any good. Mother Teresa will go where Mother Teresa is going to go, presumably with God. Um, but we're going to go where we have chosen with our own choice. And our choice is sin or connect with God. So those are the, the five that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. We're going to get into a new one today. So without further ado, let me move into chapter 15 here. It's Chapter 15 is the last page of your handout. By the way, I'm sorry, for those of you joining us at home, welcome. We are delighted to have you all here today. And uh, we have class notes that we're following in class. You can get them from your, uh, from your Facebook site or from your YouTube site. And uh, those are the notes everyone's following. And the other thing you'll need to connect with us today is your Bible. So your, if you'll open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, or if you're here in class, you have it right here in your handout. So let's... Get into Ezekiel chapter 15. This is Ezekiel speaking to us. He says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, how is the wood of a vine different from that of a branch from any of the trees in the forest? Is wood ever taken from it to make anything useful? Do they make pegs from it or hang things on to hang things on? And after it is thrown on the fire as fuel, and the fire burns both ends and chars the middle, is it then useful for anything? If it was not useful for anything when it was whole, how much less can it be made into something useful when the fire has burned it and it is charred? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. As I have given the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest as fuel for the fire, so I will treat the people living in Jerusalem. I will set my face against them. Although they have come out of the fire, the fire will yet consume them. And when I set my face against them, you will know that I am the Lord. I will make the land desolate because they have been unfaithful, declares the Sovereign Lord. So I'm going to stop there for now, and we'll come back to chapter 16 later. A number of points here. And... and in Israel, in those days, people raised a lot of vines. They, they raised a lot of wine. Israel is a beautiful country for raising wine. We've been there, and there were wineries a whole lot of different places in Israel. So Israel is a wonderful country to raise wine, and it was in those days as well. And people did that commercially. They, they had vineyards that they used for wine. And I'm not real familiar with this piece, but 
I, I guess if you look at the branches of a, uh, or the branches and even the vines of, of wine, they're very soft and you can just snap them easily. There's, it's not like wood where you just, you know, you can't break the wood. It, it is sort of like wood, but it isn't wood like we get from a regular tree. And the people of Israel would have understa understood this analogy that when you're talking about the wood of a vine in Israel, it's very soft. There's not much you can do with it. It says in here you can't even hang a peg on it. In other words, you can't even put it up there and hang a pan from it or something. You can't use it even to support that much weight. It is that weak, and it's a very soft, weak wood that snaps easily. So what do you use the wood of a vine for? Firewood. That's exactly what it's saying here, right? God is, and people would have understood this in Israel in those days, and people that have vineyards today would understand that. But the only use you have for the wood of a vine, if it's not connected to the vine, is to use it as firewood, to burn it. And God talks here about after it's thrown into the fire as fuel, and the fuel burns both ends and chars the middle, is it useful for anything? So you have this soft wood that has almost no value for anything other than firewood. You toss this vine into the fire. The fire begins to consume it from the two ends. It gets to the middle and now it's charred. What are you gonna do? Even if you take it out, what are you gonna use it for? What, of what value is that wood? Now God is relating this to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has already been attacked twice at this point by the Babylonians. It was attacked in 605 BC, which is one end, and in 597 BC, which is the other end. And the, and the Babylonians took a lot. They took the king, they took most of the royal family, they took most of the treasure and the gold and all of that. So it's already kind of burned in twice. Now what's left is just charred. There's not much left that's worth anything. In fact, it really is worth nothing, is what God is saying. So God is saying Jerusalem as it exists right now, just after these first two invasions of the Babylonians and before the third invasion is really worthless for anything. It has no value for anything. So if it's not useful for anything, why does God care is the interesting question, right? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves. Why is God gonna care about this? He goes on to say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. As I have given the wood of the vine among the trees, um, hang on, let me just look at something here. Yeah, so he says, as I have given, As I have given the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest as fire for fuel, so I will treat the people living in Jerusalem. So the wood of the vine is not like the wood we get from a regular tree. We all have trees growing in our yard or our neighborhood or whatever, and we know that that wood is pretty solid, right? You can cut that wood down and use it to make things. You can, you know, make a hook and hang a pot from it. You can maybe, you know, you can build a house from it maybe, it depends. But that wood has uses, but this wood has no uses. And, and Jerusalem at this point in time has no use to God, is, is the point here. So he says, so I will treat the people living in Jerusalem. In other words, just as this vine is being tossed into the fire and burned, burned up, God will treat Jerusalem the same way. God is going to toss Jerusalem into the fire and let them be consumed by Babylon. Babylon is coming, the troops are coming at this point, God is going to let that happen. Then we get to that famous phrase we hear all the time in Ezekiel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. We've seen this, this is probably the 20th or 30th time we've seen that phrase in Ezekiel. Every time we see it, what it means is, Ezekiel, I'm telling you this, and I want you to give this to the Jewish people word for word, verbatim. Don't, don't put your own spin on it, give them my exact words. Remember, we heard that back at the beginning, the first time God used that phrase, that's what he meant, and he made it clear. So Ezekiel says, okay, these words I've got to, I've got to write down, and I've got to give them to Israel word for word. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. As I have given the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest as fuel for the fire, so I will treat the people living in Jerusalem. So 
Jerusalem's gonna gonna suffer because God has no use for them anymore. They have just they have allowed themselves to get so soft and so weak for God that God has no use for them anymore. Then he says, I will set my face among them. That's another one of those terms. I call it Bible speak. It's another one of those terms you see in the Old Testament that has a specific meaning. When God says, I will set my face against you, that is not a good thing, right? If God says, I will set my face against you, that means I will oppose you. God will oppose you. Uh, we don't really want God opposing us. That's never a good thing for anybody, anywhere, anytime. But he's saying it now to Jerusalem. I will set my face against you. Although they have come out of the fire, the fire will yet consume them. So they think they've been through the fire twice already because the Babylonians <coughs> have, already in, have already invaded twice, but they're not done. The Babylonians are not done with them, and God is not done with them. He's going to send the Babylonians one more time. They're going to come one more time, and this time they will destroy Israel. They will destroy Jerusalem. And then he says it again, And when I set my face against them, you will know that I am the Lord. So God is saying a second time, just in case they missed it the first time. Remember, this is word for word they're getting this. Just in case they missed it the first time, God is saying, I'm going to set my face against you. I'm going to come against you. I, God, am going to come against you, is what he's saying. And at that point, when, they come, when he comes against them and he destroys Jerusalem, and all of their false ideas of what they thought was going to happen are now destroyed, then they will know that he is God, and then they will know that he's the one who caused this. Even though the Babylonians are technically the ones that are going to come and kill everybody, God is the one who sent them. God is the one who okayed it. God is the one who makes it happen. Behind the scenes, God is making all this happen. It says in the book of Daniel that the, um, that the leadership among, among nations is always subjected to God, that God determines who's leading and where they're leading, even among, Gentile, even among evil Gentile nations, and that's true today as well. And then God goes on to say, and I will make the land desolate because they have been unfaithful. So not only is God going to destroy them, but he's going to make their land, the precious land of Israel, desolate for a long time. For the next 70 years, basically nothing's going to grow there in Israel because there'll be nobody there to tend it for that 70 years. So the Babylonians are about to take the Jews into captivity, and they're going to disappear from, from Israel for 70 years. And when they come back, the land will, be ba will have been barren for 70 years. They're going to have to start all over again with the land and rebuild it into, into the beautiful land of Israel that it was to begin with. Now, a couple of things I want to get into here. First of all, any questions on any of that so far? A couple of things I want to get into here. Um, one of them is that Isaiah prophesied all this 150 years earlier. In Isaiah 13, 1 through 8, Isaiah prophesied that Israel would be destroyed by God using the nation of Babylon as its instrument. Um, you guys want me to read that? Let me read that for you. This is Isaiah 13, 1 through 8. So God told them this was going to happen. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Raise a banner on a, on a bare hilltop. Shout to them, reckon to them, to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones, I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. Like a noise on the mountains, like that of a great multitude, listen an uproar among the kingdoms, like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. The country would be Israel. Wait, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize him. Pain and anguish will grip him. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. 
See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. That is called a, prop, a prophecy against Babylon. By the way, he goes on. I don't have time to read the whole thing, but in verse 19, he actually names Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride. So he's, talk, he's talking here about Babylon will be coming, will be the nation that is coming. So... As I said, Babylon had already come twice. They were about to come a third time, and this time they were going to finish the job. Now, a lot of Jews were sitting around at that point thinking, don't worry, it's not going to happen to us. We're God's people. We have been the chosen people. God made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Moses at Mount Sinai. He made a covenant with our ancestors. He's always protected us. Just 107 years later, he killed 180,000 Babylonians for us. Uh, I'm sorry, Syrians for us. God will always protect us. That was this idea that we're special. We deserve protection because we are God's people. That's the idea that they have, right? And that was the idea that they had. And God is saying, uh-uh, you don't deserve protection. Nobody deserves protection. God tells them what this is all about back in Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy next. Deuteronomy 4, um, verses 37 through 38. I'll read you that. This is where God tells them about this. Deuteronomy 4, 37. Because he loved your, grand, your forefathers and chose their descendants after them, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you the nations greater and stronger than you, and to bring their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. So first of all, God's the one who gave them Israel in the first place, right? It says right there in Deuteronomy. God's the one who made the decision that Israel would be special enough to get, is that the Jews would be special enough to get Israel in the first place. Now let's continue that thought by going on to Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 through 8. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the Pharaoh of Egypt. So Israel, the reason you are so blessed with everything and with the land of Israel is not because you're deserving of it. It's because there are other people, and it's not because you're so good, right? It's because there are other people that are more evil and because God swore an oath to Abraham and to your ancestors at Mount Sinai. That's why you guys have got this, not because you are inherently good. Key thing, a lot of people at this time weren't understanding that. They were deeply in their sin and they weren't going back and reading this and understanding it. Now let's follow it to its logical conclusion in Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 5. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do you say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness? Hmm. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of this land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Israel, you're not getting this all these blessings in this beautiful land because you're good and you're righteous. It's not something you are inherently entitled to because you're Jews. You're getting this because, first of all, those guys are evil. And secondly, God has blessed you through his covenant with your ancestors. That's why you're getting it. Now, that covenant had terms, right? 
that covenant didn't just say, hey, Israel, you can go sin all you want and I'm going to be your God forever, no matter what you do. That's not the covenant of Mount Sinai that everybody agreed to. The covenant of Mount Sinai, if you go back to the book of Exodus and read it, there's a lot, a lot in it, but the covenant of Mount Sinai has thing, had things that the Jews had to do for God. It was 635 things they had to do for God, plus 10 commandments they had to keep. They have to do things to earn that. And what's happened over the last couple of hundred years here is they haven't done that. They have walked away from that and just assumed that because God defended them from the Assyrians back in Hezekiah's time, he was just automatically going to defend them from the Babylonians now. So why not just get real sinful and let it all go, right? Why not, you know, God's going to protect us. So that's today's excuse, right? We are inherently deserving of the Lord's protection for whatever reason. And by the way, we can get into that same thing today as Christians, right? We can get into the same idea that we, because we're Christians, we're just inherently deserving of the Lord's protection. He's not going to allow anything bad to happen to us, right? We're Christians. Well, by being Christians and connecting to Christ, we've set up an eternal relationship with God. But that doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen to us here on earth. That's a whole different thing. It can happen to us too as Christians. Very similar concept, a little different from Israel's concept, but very similar concept. We're in a similar place that they're in because we are God, we are special people of God today because we've chosen him. Because we've chosen him, that takes us out of the whole issue of eternal punishment, but that still leaves us with issues here on earth that, that, that could hurt us. I mean, a meteorite could fall from the sky and hit you right now, right? Um, a nuclear weapon could go off. All kinds of things could happen in our world. And, and, and the fact that we are connected to Christ does not guarantee us against that. It does not mean that that's not going to happen to us. Questions on that? Okay, so um, let's move on now into chapter 16. Now, chapter 16 is a very interesting one. There are people who say, don't you know the Bible is pornographic? And they always point to chapter 16 of Ezekiel. So you're going to see some pretty sexually graphic stuff as we go through here. A little bit of it this week. Most of it you're going to see next week. It's also the longest chapter in Ezekiel. It's 63 verses, so it's going to take us two weeks to cover it all. Um, but there is a lot of, of imagery in here, of sex, sex orient, or sexually oriented imagery, where God compares Israel to a prostitute. And he gets pretty graphic in here. So if, if this offends you, I'm sorry, but it is in the Bible, and I am going to read it. And we are going to talk about it. So let me start with chapter 16. If you want to go to your notes with the uh, handout, and those of you at home, please open your Bibles to chapter 16. I'm going to read the first 21 verses, and we're going to study that today, and we're going to do the rest of it next week. This is Ezekiel speaking again. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with joy or with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I, this would be God, then I passed by and saw you kicking about in, the, in your blood. As you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. <clears throat> Later I passed by, and when I looked at you, I saw that you were old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. 
I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen, linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was honey, olive oil, and the finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. But <coughs> you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. <coughs> you took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution. You went to him and he possessed your beauty. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. And you took your embroidered cloth clothes to put on them, and you offered my oil and incense before them. Also the food I provided for you, the flour, olive oil, and honey I gave you to eat, you offered as fragrant incense before them. This is what happened, declares the Sovereign Lord. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. So there's lots in there. <coughs> Basically, this is an, um, an analogy, an allegory. I guess allegory is a better word for it. That talks about God's relationship with Jerusalem. And what he says is, first of all, Jerusalem didn't start out as this wonderful, godly city. Jerusalem started out as a very despised city. If you go back all the way to the time when, um, when the Jews first crossed the, the Jordan River, and they were looking at the various parts of Israel to conquer, they had no interest in conquering Jerusalem. It was just a place you wouldn't want to go, right? They, they did not conquer Jerusalem during that entire period under Joshua, under the judges. Even under Saul, they never conquered Jerusalem. It wasn't until David came along that God told David to conquer Jerusalem. And that was about 400 years later. So for 400 years, they were in Israel controlling most of it, and they never felt it necessary to go and conquer Jerusalem. It just They despised Jerusalem. Now, if you look at the location of Jerusalem on a map, you've got Jerusalem which is a, in the Jebusite area. And over here you have the Hittites. Over here. And over here you have the um, Amorites. But what God is saying here is Jerusalem, you grew up as a Jebusite city. You were not, you were not Jewish. You were Jebusite. You grew up as a Jebusite city. And you were right between the Hittites and the Amorites. And so you were in this pagan, godless place where you were just an ugly, ugly city and nobody wanted you. And that's what God is saying to start with here. So Jerusalem, you were born in a really bad place. And he goes on to explain that in, in very graphic terms. He talks about a, an abandoned baby, right? A baby who's born, they don't even bother to cut the cord or cut it properly. Uh, they don't wash the baby, they don't put any salt on. I'm not sure why you put salt on a baby, but I don't know much about that. Um, but anyway, they don't put salt on the baby. Uh, nobody loves the baby, and they just take the baby and leave it in an open field and just let it die. And that sounds horrible to us, and it is, but that's what some mothers did back in those days. If, if a mother had a child that she didn't want, she could take that child and put it in a field and just let it die in that field. And that's kind of what Jerusalem was in those days. It was just like a, an unwanted child, a neglected child. And uh, the Amorites didn't want it, the Hittites didn't want it, the Canaanites didn't want it. it nobody wanted it. And so it's laying there, you think of, a, of an unwanted child laying in the field abandoned, and somebody walks by, 
and saves that child. And the person who walks by is God. God comes by and saves that child. He saves Jerusalem. So why does he save Jerusalem? Well, we're about to find out. He, ta- he saves Jerusalem. First of all, he, he says, Then I passed by, that would be God, and I saw you kicking about in your blood, and you, as you lay there in your blood, and I said to you, live. So God said to Jerusalem, live, right? Come, be, you know, be alive. You're not going to die. You're going to live. And God then kind of took care of her, brought her up as she went from a, from a baby to a young child to a young girl to puberty and on into the point where she now becomes an attractive woman. And she becomes God's woman. So she is an attractive woman. And God grew her up. But she was still naked. And she was naked because she was not with God yet. God had not yet come in and taken her over, which would happen when, when David took over Jerusalem. Then he goes on in verse 8 to say, Later I passed by. So this is the second time God passes by, passes by. Jerusalem now. So God passes by Jerusalem a second time. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. So this is talking about two things. First of all, it's talking about the story of Ruth and Boaz, which I'm going to get into. And then it's talking about what happened in the desert at Mount Sinai when God made a covenant with Israel. So let's do the Ruth and Boaz part first. We're going to look at that. <coughs> that is in the book of Ruth. And I have that in your notes. You, you won't need to look this one up. I have that in your notes. This is in Ruth chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. And in this scene, Ruth, who, by the way, Ruth is not a Jew. Ruth is, is, a, is a Gentile. Ruth is, uh, Naomi is actually the Jew in this story, but Ruth is Naomi's, Moabite. huh? Moabite. Moabite, correct, I'm sorry. Moabite, which is a Gentile. Uh, at any rate, Ruth goes at night and lays at the feet of Boaz. Boaz is a Jew. Boaz, by the way, is in the line of Christ. He is in the, he is a Christ. Uh, Joseph will be a descendant of Boaz. So it says, Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet. So he's sleeping on the threshing floor. Ruth approaches quietly, uncovers his feet, and lays down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the cover, cover of your garment over me, she said since you are a kinsman redeemer. So at that point, he covers her with her garment, which is his way of saying that he is accepting his role as her, as her kinsman redeemer, and that means he will marry her, and they then go on and get married, and they produce offspring who eventually become David. David is the offspring of Ruth and Boaz, and eventually, continuing on down, Joseph, the father of Jesus, is the <laughs> offspring of Ruth and Boaz as well. So that's the first thing that's being talked about here is the a kinsman redeemer. I don't have time to completely develop that here in class. That's a, a subject for a whole other hour of class. But a kinsman redeemer is something that's in the Bible where if a husband dies and his wife does not have a child and, does, and, a, and a woman couldn't own property in those days, his brother can marry or some kinsman of his, usually his brother, but some kinsman of his can marry his wife and redeem her Inheritance. In other words, he can, he can redeem her ability to have children that will now be in the line of descent from the original father, and he can redeem the property for her. It's called a kinsman redeemer. Boaz did that for Ruth. He actually did that for Naomi as well. So that's a kinsman redeemer. That's the concept. Jesus, of course, is our kinsman redeemer. He is our redeemer who came and did that for us. And the way that Boaz did it for Ruth is she laid at his feet and he put his garment over her. And by doing that, by covering her, she was now covered by him as his kinsman redeemer. So Jesus covers him, covers us with his blood on the cross. Same concept. Questions on that? 
So that was the first thing that was being talked about in that verse I just read you. The second thing was the covenant itself of Mount Sinai. So God took Israel at Mount Sinai, brought them all out into a place in the desert, and talked to all of them with a voice that was just thunderous and that just amazed them, and set up a covenant with them that day, and that is the covenant of all the things that they have to do to be good Jews. And because of that, God has blessed them over that period of time. So <coughs> just going back to where we were in the, in the thing here, he says, Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord. So that's what he's talking about. Now, so at this point, Israel is his. Israel now belongs to God because of the covenant in the desert at Mount Sinai. So now what we're going to look at in the next few verses is what happened with Israel over the next couple of hundred years. He says, I bathed you with water, I washed you, I washed the blood from you, I put ointment on you, I clothed you, I put embroidered dresses and sandals of fine leather on you, I dressed you in fine linen, I covered you with costly garments, I adorned you with jewelry, I put bracelets on your arms, I put necklaces around your neck, I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. I, you know, the food I gave you was honey, olive oil, and the finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. So this is talking about those several hundred years now when Israel was loyal to God and Israel and God blessed and blessed and blessed Israel through David's time and all the way up into the beginning of Solomon's time. The point where Israel became a queen, if you will, was in the time, the early time of Solomon. The time when Solomon was building the temple out of faith. Not the time later when Solomon was marrying half the, half the pagan women in the world. The early time when Solomon was following God's, what God wanted him to do. And God just blessed Israel and blessed them and blessed them. And Israel was one of the finest empires the world's ever seen at that time under the, under, the time, under the reign of King Solomon. It was just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. It says you became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. So up until Solomon's time, things were just going great for Israel. But something happened. And it happened in, let me find the verse again. It happened in 1 Kings 11.1. <coughs> In 1 Kings 11.1, 1, it says <coughs> Solomon loved many foreign women. Solomon made a mistake. After, being, after Israel just being blessed and blessed and blessed by God, Solomon made the mistake of bringing, of, of bringing all these foreign wives into the palace. And because they were all the daughters of kings, they were all allowed to bring their own idols. They were all allowed to bring their own priests. They were allowed to set up their own altars right in the palace. So Solomon made the mistake of bringing idolatry, hundreds of idolatrous wives and their, and their priests and their idols and their altars into the palace. He made that mistake. That was the beginning of the end for Israel. That was what began to lead Israel into sin and Israel descended. So now we get to verse 15, but, right? God has told us all about how great it was for Israel, how, how beautifully he adorned her up until that time but what happened? You trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. Prostitute is Bible speak for you worshipped idols, right? That means that you began worshipping idols at that time. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed <coughs> by and your beauty became his. So rather than being loyal to God, rather than worshipping God, you were worshipping all these idols during this period. You took some of your beautiful garments and made gaudy high places and you carried on where you carried on your prostitution. So you took all these nice garments that God gave you and used them to clothe your idols. And you carried on your idolatry there. You went to him and he possessed your beauty. So you went to all these different idols and they owned you, not God anymore. You also took fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. That's one of those verses that kind of makes you sit back and say, oh, okay, God actually said that. Um, basically, they took 
jewelry, gold, melted it down, and used it to make idols. We saw that with the golden calf way back in, in, in the desert in Mount Sinai. Here they took all this beautiful gold and silver that God had given them when they left Egypt and turned it into a golden calf. Well, they were doing it during this period as well. You took your embroidered clothes to put on them. You put, them, you put your clothes <coughs> on the idols. You offered my oil and incense before them. So all the gifts I had given you, all these beautiful gifts, you offered them to the idols instead of to me. And the food I provided you, the flour, the olive oil, and the honey I gave you to eat, you offered as fragrant incense before them. So you took all this beautiful food I gave you and sacrificed it to idols. That is what happened, declares the Son of the Lord. So God is saying, over this period, from the time of King Solomon, which was nine, about 950, 960 B.C., down to this time, which is 590 B.C., it's about almost 400 years. For 400 years, Israel was going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into sin during this period. And then, the worst of the worst of the worst... God says, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. When you read the Bible, the ultimate sin, the worst sin, the one that God is most detests is sacrificing your children to idols. That is the absolute ultimate sin in the Bible that God just despises. And here it is. They did it. Right? They did it right here. Nothing God detests more than taking your children and sacrificing them to idols. There are people in the world who do human sacrifice. Even today there are places in the world where they do human sacrifice. It's detestable to God. It's even worse if you're sacrificing your sons and daughters, your children, to God. Was your prostitution not enough? In other words, worshiping idols, was, wasn't that bad enough, guys? Worshiping idols. You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. So God is saying, it's not, it's not bad enough that you guys gave yourself over the idols. You took my beautiful children and gave them to the idols too. God is just so upset with this here. It's just incredible. So and I'm going to stop here for this week. Next week we're going to get into what God's going to do about this, right? And, and that's going to be the rest of this chapter, which is, gets on. And, and then God continues the whole concept of them being a prostitute and just having completely given themselves over to sin rather than, uh, than to him. So that's where we are for today. Anybody have any questions on what we're doing? Well, thanks for joining us. Those of you at home, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. And uh, have a blessed week, and have a good Thanksgiving as well.